Hiya and welcome to Audiobook Basics for Authors Part 4. In this video I'm going to talk about what to do once you've chosen a narrator and the actual process of working with one. Now, caveat, every narrator is different. I'm going to talk about my progress, how I work with authors, what I do, and I'll say a little bit about what I know some other narrators do, but you need to talk to yours. Your mileage may vary. Talk to your narrator. Okay. All right. So you've narrowed down your shortlist. You've selected a narrator you want to work with. They have indicated that they're happy with your offered PFH rate or that they're going to do RS or RS plus or RD with you. And they've said that they can com deliver the completed files in your time frame. What comes next? This is going to depend on two things. Firstly, the platform that you're working through. And secondly, how your narrator prefers to work. For the purposes of this video, I'm going to assume that you are working directly with your narrator. As I work with most of my clients, and I'm going to tell you how I handle things. If you're working through ACX or Findaway or an audiobook production company, some things might be different. Your narrator is still all going to need all the information that I'm going to give to you now, but the way of getting it across to them and the way you receive files may be different. I'm going to cover it the way most Aussie authors are going to cover it, working directly with your narrator. Before I start, before I sign a binding contract, I insist on reading the book. This is because of my own code of ethics. I do not want to put my name to certain things. I reserve the right to decline a book if it falls into one of my refusal categories. I will just say, thanks, but no thanks, this is not for me. Lots of narrators have things they won't narrate. Um, explicit sex is quite a common one. So narrators just won't do it. I have no problem with doing that, um, but I do refuse to narrate things like rape, um, especially glorified as romance, stalking glorified as romance I have problems with, won't do underage sex. Um, if I find that a book has homophobic or racist content or anything else that I just it crosses an ethical line for me, I will absolutely tell an author that I am not the best fit for this and they should look elsewhere. This has not happened to me yet, but I have no doubt that it will. And I also know that I'm not going to lose sleep over it when and if it does, because the stuff I don't want to read, the stuff I don't want to put my name to, and it is my right to do that. Some narrators may decline to put their main name on it, but they may have an author sued they do it under. There are quite a few male narrators in particular who do romance under suits. Um, some of them are quite well known. So you may approach somebody and then discover that they won't put their name to it, which again can be a problem if you were counting on their name, but you might find that they've got a suit, which is just as famous in another genre. So always ask the question. Some narrators happily go to contract without having the full book in hand. I am not one of them. I am going to ask you to send me the whole book, preferably as a Word or a Google Doc, because of the way I then work with it. Other narrators might ask for an EPUB or a PDF. Give them whatever they ask for. If you only have one format and you don't know how to convert it, say that and just send them what you've got. Um, they will figure it out. I certainly do. But if you can provide what they ask for, please do that. Bear in mind that they probably need to pass it along to an editor and a proofreader. So don't do anything silly like send a single use book funnel code. Your narrator is a professional you are now in partnership with. They are not about to pirate your book. Settle down with the paranoia. Okay? And absolutely do not ask them to buy the book in order to read it. I saw a story where someone had done this the other day and I nearly died. The narrator just walked away and I, I would have walked away too. Hideously unprofessional. Don't, your, your narrator is not your customer. Give them the book in the form that they need the book. I like a Google Doc and I will make whatever format I'm given into a Google Doc and I will share it back with the author. And here's why. I will have queries on pronunciation and I will find tiny little proofreading things as I go through the book. Um, I've done over 30 books now, and even the best edited ones, I've still found one or two tiny things and shared them back. Things like a missing punctuation mark, or um, 
the words to T-O, T-W-O and T-O-O, if you use the wrong one of those, it doesn't actually make a difference to how it sounds for my narration, but it makes a difference for the author as a proofreader. You might want to re-upload the new version. You know, the authors I work with do appreciate this. I've had one ask me if she can hire me as a proofreader, and I'm like, that's not actually my job, but hire me for audio and you get a free proofread anyway. Not all narrators do this. Um, you can ask. I do. You will get a very intense proofread. Um, you could even use me as your final proofer. Um, if you're doing a simultaneous release, I might be the last set of eyes on the book before yours. You will get some final proofing. If your book is not well edited or proofed, your narrator may well hand it back and go, no, sorry. On ACX, it's actually a requirement that the book be fully edited and proofed before it go in. You won't mind one or two small things. The odd thing does slip by, but don't expect us to be your editor for free. That is not our job. Okay, once I've read the book over and I'm happy with it, I prepare a contract. I include an appendix with delivery dates. I give myself a lot of leeway, like a month more than I think I need, because something like a head cold, for example, is going to absolutely derail my schedule very easily and make a big mess. I always advise the author privately when I actually think I'm going to get it done, but I give myself lots of wiggle room in the contract, and I don't usually send out contracts until not more than a couple of weeks before I'm actually going to start the book. Again, because start dates can slip, stuff can go wrong. I don't want to set myself up for failure. I will give you an estimated date. I'm going to record your book um, in the first week of November, but you won't get a contract from me until mid-October when I'm certain I can stick to those dates I'm putting in it. I share finished files back with the author by uploading them to a shared box.net folder. And I do ask authors to do their final proof listen and listen to the files and approve them, or send me corrections, pickups as narrators call them, as I go along. I find this makes it quicker for completion of the overall book. However, this is not the norm. Most narrators deliver the whole book at once, and you will then have a certain amount of time to indicate your approval or send through corrections on the whole thing. 14 days is pretty normal. It's what I ask for, but I will deliver you, uh, you know, when I'm working, I'm usually delivering one to two chapters a day. That's how it goes. Depends on the length of your chapters, but that's about an average. I can't emphasize strongly enough that you must do a proof listen on your files, even if you hate listening to audiobooks. Sit down with a copy of your book and your headphones and read along as you listen. Take notes, be specific. Your list of corrections needs to include timestamps. So you might say, chapter two, 14 minutes and eight seconds. You said, she grabbed her arm instead of she grabbed his arm. Easy little mistake to make. I sometimes do that sort of thing. You might hear a click. You might hear a mouth noise or a sigh. Put it in, put it in with a timestamp. It makes it a lot easier for us to find the spot in the audio file we need to fix and if you put in the sentence we're saying, the part in the manuscript we need to re-record. When we do pickups, you can't do one word, it's just not possible. You do a whole sentence. And if I'm in dialogue and I've got a particular character voice, I will often do a whole speech in order to make sure everything matches up right. You cannot do single words, it just doesn't work. Okay, what else do you need to give your narrator? This depends on the narrator. Um, some of them will send you a character questionnaire to fill out, asking you to give names, ages, backgrounds, accents, a few words that describe their general attitude. Descriptors like arrogant, cheerful, optimistic, resentful, proud, naive. These can really help when a narrator is trying to get the character's voice right. And if you are planning on doing a series with this narrator, definitely tell them if side characters in this book are getting their own books later. This can save a lot of grief. If I know a character is coming back later, I will cut together a short file of lines of dialogue from them and I will save it so I can easily get the voice back. And I will also make sure I don't give them a voice I can't easily replicate. If I think they've got a few lines, I might do a voice I don't do a lot, but it's not easy for me. I need to know if they're coming back as a major character later. If there are any unconventional names, people's names or place names, try and give the narrator the pronunciation for them. Google pronounced this name, 
and listen to the results. You'll find YouTube, forvo.com, pronunciation.com. There's plenty of sites out there which will have helpful things. Find one you're happy with and send that to the narrator. Believe me, your narrator will appreciate it, this. If it's a fantasy name you've made up, or a conventional name you want pronounced differently to the normal, record yourself saying it and send that in. It is a narrator's nightmare to do an entire book with a character they assume is named David, and then to find out that the author actually thinks it's pronounced David. Narrators are human, and we sometimes make assumptions that we know things. I got caught out with a Colin. The author wanted it pronounced Colin. <laughs> Fortunately, the author caught it in the first chapter it was used in, and I only had half a dozen corrections to do. Another advantage of approving chapters as they're completed, in my opinion, you can get pick up things like that before you've recorded an entire book and have a thousand pickups of it. The differences between British English and American English need to be considered here as well. Um, words like floral or floral, Caribbean or Caribbean, tomato and tomato, yogurt and yogurt, aluminum and aluminium. If you want words pronounced a specific way, make that clear up front. I get this quite a bit because I narrate Regency Romance and sometimes my non-British clients get taken by surprise as I pronounce a word in the British English way and they didn't expect it. I'm happy to do whatever you want with it. You're the client. But you need to tell me because I can't read minds. I'm just, I, and I do make assumptions. I don't check every single word. I make assumptions that I know how it's pronounced. If you think it's a different way and you're listening back to it, tell me quickly um, before I need to change lots and lots of things. With all this said, once the narrator has all the information they need, you need to take a step back and let them work. Please don't try to be the director here. That is not your job. Most narrators will do either a first chapter or first 15 minutes and ask you to approve that before they move on. If you have any directorial input, that is the time to give it. Say the narrator has a character's attitude and voice wildly off what you think it should be. Talk about that. Open a dialogue. This heroine isn't a wide-eyed ingenue. She's a 35-year-old cynical widow. Could you please try to make her sound a bit less breathy and naive? That is valid feedback. So is pointing out that an inflection is in the wrong place in a sentence that changes the entire meaning of things. That last one is a little bit of a fine line to tread. You need to trust the narrator who is a professional actor who you have cast for this role to interpret the role as they see fit. Give them all the upfront guidance you can, but please resist the temptation to micromanage them. If that inflection is in a place where the meaning of the sentence is absolutely critical to the storyline, by all means ask them to change it. Otherwise, Maybe ask yourself if it's really that important and maybe just try to let it go. For a narrator, the best clients are the ones who trust us to do our jobs. They provide all the relevant information and they answer our questions up front. Then they step back and let us run with the work. When the files are delivered, they come back quickly with a clear list of time-stamped corrections and then they pay on time. You want to be that kind of client. Narrators will want to work with you. They won't suddenly become too busy to fit you in halfway through a series. Don't get me wrong, that can happen anyway, but you don't want it to be your fault. I personally will bend over backwards to fit my favourite clients in when they need me. I give them series discount rates. I tell them if I hear about promotions coming up, I talk about their books and what a pleasure they are to work with. But the only thing I don't do is leave rev reviews for their books on Amazon or Goodreads because I have a professional relationship with them and I don't think that's appropriate. So please don't ask me to review your book. Even if I hate your book, I wouldn't actually tell you because that's hideously unprofessional. I am still going to perform it to the best of my ability. It's my job. It's what you're paying me for. 
happening. Every narrator has their own way of doing things. Listen to yours, ask what they need from you, and work with them. Do not be an authorzilla. <laughs> be a professional and treat your narrator as a fellow professional and you will build a great working relationship that will benefit both of you long term. This is especially important if you have a series. You really want to have a consistent narrator for the entire series, not just because listeners really like this, and they do, but because of box sets or bundles. It is much more complicated to get a box set out there if the same narrator hasn't done the entire series. And it is flat out impossible if royalty share deals are involved with more than one narrator. Impossible, as in you literally cannot. You cannot do it. Okay, you want the same narrator for the series, if at all possible. Box sets can be big money makers in audio. So if you have a series, you will absolutely want to think about that during down the road. If you find a good narrator, lock them in for as much of the series as you can. Book them to do a book a month or every three months. If you can't afford to do the whole thing straight up, that's okay. I've got several authors with multi-book backlist sets and I work in basically a book a month for them and I record box sets credits as required for them to bundle up later. Because conventional wisdom basically goes, as soon as you do a box set, you cannibalise sales of the individual books. So get the meat out of those first. Put out your six books, one after the other, one a month. Give them at least six months after you put the last one out to all get some good sales on the individual books, then do a box set. Okay, that's how you do this in audio. That's how it works. Okay, so having talked about a relationship with a narrator, what if you don't want to go there? What if you want to give narrating a go yourself? In the next video, I'm going to talk about when you might want to consider doing that some of the things you need to know if you're going to do that, along with some tools to get you started and my recommendation for some basic equipment to be going on with. And you can absolutely get cracking on this with stuff you've already got, some free software and less than a hundred bucks worth of recording equipment. You don't need thousands and thousands of dollars worth of gear. It's not that crazy. It's a little bit of a steep learning curve, but if you really want to do it, give it a go. If you're not interested in doing your own narration, you can skip this next video. There's nothing in it that you need to know if you plan to hire a professional to narrate for you. Okay, you can skip this one, go to the next one. I'll see you there.